Thanks for uh, coming in um, this morning for our first grand round session of the new academic year. Um, and just a reminder, if you're here in FNEC, blue tape so you can eat and drink, otherwise masks on, please. Um, so this year, uh, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Christopher D. Uh, kick off our uh, grand rounds. Um, we're excited about the grand rounds program this year. We're hoping um, to have a bit more of a focus on some orthopedic challenges. We'll have some guest speakers coming on uh, later in the year from various institutions as well. So I think uh, this is a great way to start out the, uh, the Wednesday sessions. Um, a lot of you know Dr. D. Uh, it is, um, he found his way to St. Louis after going to Miami for med school and then going to the hospital for special surgery for residency uh, before coming here to St. Louis to complete his hand and micro uh, surgery fellowship, for which he is now the fellowship director this year. Um, Chris's uh, clinical interest focuses on uh, treatment of complex peripheral nerve injuries, including brachial plexus injuries, which he'll talk about today. He's quickly developed into an international expert and a young up and coming academic surgeon with uh, a fair amount of uh, pretty impressive grant uh, proposals that have been successful in building up a very, very impressive uh, qualitative uh, research portfolio into investigating sort of what happens to patients after brachial plexus injuries. Um, for those of you that don't know, Dr. D is probably the second most active member on social media of our faculty uh, behind Dr. Goldfarb, who I think now has 27 different social media accounts um, that he is currently uh, trying to manage right now. Um, Dr. D is also number two on the leaderboard of Peloton for the uh, hashtag Wash Your Bone Crew to Dad Bod Mega. Um, but uh, I don't know who that is. That? I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is, <laughs> but uh, you know, but uh, you'll see him usually every morning. Uh, he's my motivation to make sure if I to get up and. Uh, and go around. So um, we'll see how that goes. But um, we're excited for Dr. D to talk this morning about uh, his uh, experience in brachial plexus injuries, as well as giving us some insight into his own sort of path um, in developing a research portfolio as a young uh, academic orthopedic surgeon. Um, I think this first part about 30, 45 minutes, we'll take a quick break. And then the second part about 30, 45 minutes. Um, for those of y'all that are in uh, APNEC, if you have questions, feel free just to raise your hand and then we'll repeat them on the mic so uh, people on the Zoom can hear it as well. So uh, please welcome in joining uh, Dr. D. Okay, well, good morning. Um, this works. So it's great to be in person again. Uh, it's been a long time since I've actually given a talk in person, so forgive me if I'm a bit rusty, but uh, thank you for joining um, and attending on Zoom and here in EPNEC. Um, so as Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, we will be uh, breaking the talk up into two parts, one being more clinically focused, orthopedic focused, and the second being a bit more on career development and a path towards, uh, towards funding, if that's what you choose to pursue. Um, Alex, thank you for the great introduction. You are a wonderful accountability partner on the leaderboard. And again, we're all chasing dad bod mega. So today I wanted to talk about our approach to treatment of brachial plexus injury and thinking about what potentially we're missing as we approach these patients with these really complex and devastating problems. I do have research support to disclose, um, and I've been very fortunate, more than disclosures, it's really gratitude. Um, so I've been the recipient of uh, multiple grants uh, to fund our work in the, the realm of brachial plexus, including a career development board from NIAMS um, that just recently wrapped, a uh, foundation grant from the American Foundation for the Surgery of the Hand, um, an ORAF mentored clinician scientist grant to supplement the K award, an R01 award, which just started in April, and an R03 award, which started in July. So a lot of things have been developing uh, along the way, and it's been very nice to see them come to fruition. I cannot start this talk without thanking my partners who have allowed me to establish uh, a niche and an angle um, that I've been pursuing and have allowed me to have additional academic time than most. Um, I, you know, I really owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Gelberman, who hired me, Dr. Boyer, Dr. Goldfarb, the co-chiefs of the service when I started, and now uh, Dr. Calpy, the chief of our service, as well as fantastic partners in Dr. Wall and Dr. Brogan. Brachial plexus injuries are devastating. These are really, really, really tough patients to take care of. Um, you know, they devastate patients in multiple domains, neurologically, emotionally, and economically. Um, it does have a ripple effect, which, you know, beyond what we take care of as orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, neurosurgeons, hand surgeons, beyond the plexus injury, beyond this devastating, what some have called the stroke of the upper limb, um, you have substantial mental health implications. Some of the work that we've done has demonstrated about half of these patients develop depression or anxiety after their brachial plexus surgery, and a quarter of them develop both. And that's real. And we see that every day in our nerve clinic. 
um, there's a substantial cost that comes with this. You know, it's expensive for the patients. And, you know, unfortunately, these patients tend to be those that don't have the most resources. And then there's a tremendous indirect cost to society, showing an impetus for us to try and restore function and get our patients back to being functioning members of society. So I wanted to frame today's discussion about brachial plexus injuries uh, through a patient who actually came through our ED. Um, so thank you to those of you in the audience that have helped to take care of this gentleman. Um, he was in a conveyor belt accident at work, so a work comp patient, 33-year-old gentleman, about six weeks prior to presenting to our clinic. He had an elbow dislocation that was expertly treated by Dr. McAndrew um, and our residents, of course. Um, he is here because he's got essentially um, you know, no ability to bend his elbow um, and no wrist, fu no wrist function. When talking to him, he seems like a kind of normal 33-year-old guy, um, doesn't have any mental health symptoms that we know of that he reports, um, and has not had any treatment for those issues in the past. Seems like he's got good support. He's accompanied by his girlfriend, and like I mentioned, he does have insurance coverage through workers' compensation. On examination six weeks out from his injury, he's got a great cuff, um, which is really, really helpful, but he's got absolutely no deltoid when you isolate that on examination. He's got no elbow flexion, no elbow extension. He has a wrist drop. He can flex, but when he flexes his wrist, it's completely ulnarly deviated. He's got no wrist extension, as I mentioned, and he's got no pronation, no pronation and no supination. And he's got no FPL function. He's got no median innervated long extrinsic type of flexion. He's got some flexion in his ring and small finger coming through his ulnar nerve, and he's got decent intrinsics. Um, and certainly this helps us a lot that we've got a reasonable hand to work with because as many of you know, that is the hardest thing. So in your mind right now, I'm sure Dr. Tian, you're trying to localize this lesion. I won't pick on anybody today, don't worry. So the questions that I try to, um, uh, to address when I'm seeing a, a plexus patient for the first time is, you know, where is the lesion? I'm trying to take something that has this aura of being very difficult and challenging to take care of because it is, but it is a bit intimidating when you're the resident, you're the fellow in the clinic. These are things you need to know. Where is this lesion? Will this lesion get better on its own? And that is really, really hard to predict. And that's where the magic is a bit in trying to take care of these patients. And sometimes we get it really right and sometimes we get it wrong. And then if it's not gonna get better on its own, what can you do to help? And sometimes you have great options and sometimes you don't. So thinking about this gentleman who had the same exam and similar nerve studies as six weeks and three months. So thinking about his inability to fire his deltoid, his inability to, um, uh, to extend his elbow, his inability to extend his wrist, his inability to flex his elbow, and his lack of median innervated, um, you know, uh, long extrinsic function. So we know his musculocutaneous nerve is involved, can't bend his elbow. Okay. We know the lateral cord contribution to the median nerve is involved because he can't fire his FPL. He can't fire his FDP to his index and his middle. So that leads us back to localizing this to the lateral cord. We know he can't fire his deltoid. So his axillary nerve is involved. And then his radial nerve is involved because he can't uh, fire his triceps and he can't extend his wrist. Now, one thing I didn't tell you is that he has a good lat. So that helps us localize this lesion. So we've got a lateral cord injury and a posterior cord injury, but you can see here the thoracodorsal nerve is intact. So the lesion is somewhere in here. And given the mechanism, it's a conveyor belt injury. So it's probably not an actual stretch to the point where the nerve avulses type of injury, although we have seen that. The nerve is probably structurally intact, but there's probably some really, really bad injury inside the nerve that we're worried about, clearly leading to this nerve not working. Now it's a bit controversial as to how you treat this patient going forward as, in terms of timing. I'm fortunate enough, like I said earlier, to work with Dr. Brogan, and he and I see these patients together, and it helps us decide, you know, is this the time to, to do something, or is this the time to continue observing? So at the three-month mark, we decided, um, based on the nerve studies, his physical examination, and the patient's goals, uh, that it was probably time to go to the operating room. So we performed an infraclavicular ex exploration of this uh, gentleman's brachial plexus. So this is through an extended delta pec approach, and you can see the cords of the brachial plexus here. And here is his axillary nerve coming off of the posterior cord. Everything here in the lateral cord, posterior cord, all this looks really beat up. And then imagine if you were feeling this nerve in surgery, it feels absolutely hard, firm, woody, that kind of thing. His medial cord's back here. And that actually is, we know that that's working. Um, and that actually is, feels pretty good, looks decent. It doesn't look great, but it looks decent. And certainly nothing we're going to 
do for this here. But we're trying to get some elbow flexion back. So we got to get something into his um, biceps and brachialis branches of his musculocutaneous nerve. And then we're trying to get some deltoid function. And ideally, we get some triceps function too. So in brachial plexus surgery, you think about what your options are. And nerve transfers have come about as a really a, a very useful and somewhat reliable way to borrow function that is somewhat expendable and take those axons, those nerves, and funnel them into a distal target that otherwise would not receive innervation. So we know his medial cord is working, so we exploit that. We look for the medial pectoral branches through the exploration, and we find that these stimulate really well. So then we end up using his medial pectoral nerve and transferring it to his axillary nerve. And those of you that have heard Dr. Brogan talk, have heard me talk about nerve repair, you want to make sure you don't do this under too much tension. So you can't just hog tie these things together because they're not going to work. So we put in a cabled autograft um, from his medial pectoral nerve to his axillary nerve. Now that is not ideal. And many people would say, you know, if you're gonna do a nerve transfer, don't even bother doing a graft. But this was basically his best option. Otherwise you're looking at a long cabled graft for his posterior cord. Um, so we took this graft, we we're happy with that, tension-free coaptations. And then we're thinking, what can we exploit otherwise to help with his elbow flexion? So like I mentioned earlier, he's got a posterior cord injury, but his thoracodorsal nerve's intact. So he's got a functioning lat. He's not, you know, it's, I'd rather use that for something that, um, um, that is a bit higher on the priority list. So Dr. Brogan went and just like he harvested a lat flap, found this thoracodorsal nerve to the posterior approach. And we tunneled it in and after exposing the musculocutaneous nerve, we transferred that branch of the thoracodorsal, um, uh, thoracodorsal nerve to the biceps and one to the brachialis. So we were really pleased with this. And we said, well, let's try to get some kind of triceps function because if you've got your arm up and out and you want to position it in space, you do need some element of elbow extension. So we went and found the spinal accessory nerve because we're out of intraplexal donors. So we went for, um, for something that uh, wouldn't be involved in the injury and is outside of the brachial plexus. We transferred it to the triceps branch with a really long cable or really long single strand graft. Now, again, the books and a lot of people say don't do long grafts, they don't work. But honestly, this guy had no better options in terms of trying to restore triceps function. Now, we're also banking on the fact that structurally um, the posterior cord is intact. And maybe there is some component of his posterior cord that will recover because we're only transferring into one branch of the triceps. And those of you that have done this surgery and Dr. Wall, you'll see it when we do the surgery uh, tomorrow, that you know, there are at least six branches going to the triceps. So we've got a lot of different options here and hopefully something regenerates on its own too. So this is what this gentleman's reconstruction ended up being. He got a thoracodorsal to biceps, thoracodorsal to brachialis, both nerve transfers, direct coaptations. He had a medial pec to axillary with an interposed graft and a triceps, uh, excuse me, a spinal accessory to triceps with a really long interposed graft. So here he is at nine months. I hope this audio shares, let's see. Yep, all right, arms up like this. Good, okay. So plexus patients will try to fool you quite a bit. Nine months is really early, but look at how much elbow flexion he has. Now he doesn't have a full M3, can't really resist a whole lot, but at nine months, I will absolutely take this any day of the week. Now we know that's coming from the nerve transfer because that was an end to end. Now he's got M2 triceps and some would say M3 triceps. I think that's pretty darn good for nine months. Now we didn't hit an absolute home run. So when you ask patients to kind of assume this hangman position where you can try to isolate their deltoid, you can see all the compensation coming through his upper trap. And then you ask him to abduct, I guarantee you this is largely coming from his cuff. But at the end of the day, patients don't care whether it's coming from their cuff or from their deltoid. They care that they can bring their arm out in space. And then the functions you try to get back, you try to get them to touch their mouth, you gotta to try to get them to touch the back of their head, mainly so they can dress themselves and take care of themselves. So we're, we're nine months out. We're so that's nine months. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, yeah, everybody shows their best cases. This is probably one of our best cases at nine months. Um, and I would say probably even a long, longer term outcome. So everybody in the clinic, we're doing the re-innovation dance. We're incredibly happy. We've got a, a multidisciplinary clinic. Dr. Brogan and I are thrilled, hand therapist thrilled, medical student, resident fellow. We're like, there's no way this is actually working this well, but it was, and I'll take it. I don't know whether it was from his spontaneous re what we did, probably a combination of the both. But he tells us he hates it. And there's nothing more deflating than you patting yourself on the back saying, you know, we are, you know, reconstructive microsurgery, uh, uh, you know, heroes. And then a the patient telling you they hate it. Doesn't feel good at all. That drives us to essentially what we've been looking at with our research in our lab. And how do we measure outcomes? Depending on your perspective and your view, it will be very different. Now, this is how we view it. 
we think of our you know, muscle strength. That's our very binary or me, very limited um, continuous spectrum of how you assess outcomes. Um, it's either M0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. But what patients care about is quality of life and satisfaction. Can they use whatever we gave them or whatever came back on its own? And I think that's the dichotomy that we've been trying to bridge. So thanks to um, Ryan Calfee, Abby Chang for getting us these embedded promise scores. They've been incredibly useful and we've taken that and included in our research, but these are promise scores from clinic visits. So if you look at this gentleman's physical function, he's hovering kind of mid thirties here before surgery. For some reason, one of his post-op visits, he ended up quite high. But if you take that one out, which is probably an outlier, even at 11 months after surgery, he was basically the same with that exam that you saw on the video. His depression, really high, ends up basically the same, but you can see the emotional roller coaster that these patients go through. This depression probably went down because he was saying, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to get surgery. I'm going to be better right away. Um, and we try to prep patients for the fact that this is a really long haul. But essentially, his depression ended up exactly where we started, despite the fantastic result that you saw. His anxiety spiked. This is really something that's quite challenging for patients to deal with as they're going through what is a very long and arduous recovery. So nine months after surgery, we have excellent surgeon-graded outcomes. We have an M3 triceps. We've got almost an M3 biceps. He can touch his head. He can almost touch the back of his mouth. This is a great outcome in my perspective. There's no change in patient-rated function. He has unchanged depression scores, which are really high, and he has worsening anxiety. So what did we miss? As I mentioned earlier, as surgeons, we, we have tunnel vision. We tend to look at only the things that matter to us and the things that we can measure. And we did this systematic review when I was a resident. And among the 88 studies we looked at over a 20-year um, period of literature in brachial plexus, only 5% reported quality of life. All of them reported muscle strength. What we see is muscle strength and what matters to the patient is quality of life, activities of daily living, happiness, and satisfaction. So we need to change the way we look at our outcomes and we need to change our literature and look at outcomes that matter to patients. So when I was a resident, I worked with Scott Wolf and Steve Lee and Carol Mancuso. Um, and Scott had this great idea to develop an impact of brachial plexus questionnaire, a plexus specific patient rated outcome measure. And this was ahead of the big push towards promise, although it did coincide with it uh, nicely. Now, this isn't computer adaptive, but it is a plexus specific questionnaire that was derived from a lot of qualitative interviews. And it covers all the domains that we see that matter to patients, symptoms, the limitations in their activity, their emotions, their expectations for recovery, and then subsequently their improvement. And there are preoperative and postoperative versions. And we leveraged this when I got here to Wash U to try and develop some way of using this prospectively, because the only way that this instrument had been used was in the validation process at HSS. So those interviews that were used to form this questionnaire, uh, we conducted a, a interviews with 10 patients before surgery and trying to drive at expectations. Now, any of you that have seen patients with nerve injuries or been in our clinic, um, you know, these are completely unrealistic expectations. For a patient to say, I expect to get movement back in my arm. I don't expect 100%. That's unrealistic, but I expect 90. I expect to hold my daughter again with both arms. You saw how weak that patient's elbow flexion was. It's probably not gonna get substantially better from there. Maybe he'll be able to lift five pounds. If I had to say what I expect, it's for my arm to move more, to be able to bend my elbow. I expect to get my life back. Now we have to do a lot of work in the preoperative visits. And we try to have at least more than you know, one or two to really counsel to our patients, you need to lower your expectations. This is not going to be holding your daughter. This is not going to be 90% recovery. This will never be a normal arm again. Now that is balanced against not deflating them and taking away all sorts of hope because you need to give them hope. And as cheesy as that sounds, that's a really important part of their recovery. So looking at predictors of outcomes after brachial plexus injury, I, I lumped it into four categories. There's the plexus injury itself. There's where you're treated, who you're treated by, and there are patient uh, rated factors. So for the plexus injury, many of you know that the more severe the injury is, the harder it is gonna recover. So the number of levels involved, the pan plexus injury is much harder to recover than from an upper trunk. This cord level injury is actually one of the better ones that you can treat, especially when you've got a good hand. And then avulsion injuries where the, the nerve roots are ripped out of the spinal cord, those are the absolute worst and those are the hardest ones to take care of. Pain is a big part of what we see in clinic related to the nerve injury. It's common, it's pervasive, it, it, it affects the patients in so many ways that we can't even try to understand. 
And it's really difficult to treat. We have very blunt instruments to treat what is a very difficult problem for these patients. And this is outside of the wheelhouse of the orthopedic surgeon. So we have to rely on our pain management colleagues, um, which you know, can be difficult at times to get access to care. And then there's limits of actually the nerve regrowing. So we know that there's a privileged window of time in which we can try to re these muscles before denervation-related fibrosis occurs, which is irreversible. The time from injury to the surgery to then re you probably have about a year. Some people say less, some people say more. The graft length is a big limitation. You can only get so much regeneration across a cabled nerve graft or a single-strand graft. And you have limited donor nerves if you're really looking for a nerve transfer-based reconstruction. You saw that we had to go outside of the plexus for the triceps for that gentleman. Referrals are often delayed. We looked at the administrative data from the United States for patients under the age of 65, and almost a third of them have surgery over one year from injury, which is bad. And maybe this is flawed in terms of how we looked at it based on the administrative data, but the message is there. And we see this in clinic. I had somebody come to me in my first year of practice saying, well, I was told there was nothing to do until a year after the injury. Um, so this is what we're up against. And that was from a, a, an orthopedic surgeon that sent them. So there's a big challenge in terms of education of our, of our colleagues. There's a big delay when you're coming from smaller hospitals, from other networks. It's hard to get in to see us sometimes because a lot of times the diagnosis isn't made until it's far too late. Patients are frustrated when they're seeking care. This is work that uh, Marie did with us. And they can't find surgeons. They have insufficient info about treatment. Nobody has given them a diagnosis. And, and you know, when you come to our clinic, you'll see that there are some patients just happy to be told what they have, even if there's nothing you can do for them. They're just happy to know because it's part of that closure process. The financial challenges are real in these patients, especially insurance. Um, you know, uh, the way that our system works in the U.S., it can be challenging to get in and out of Medicaid. Um, there's a lot of insurance flux, and this is a paper that uh, we presented at the Hans Society a couple of years ago. And about half of patients who start with Medicaid, they end up cycling in and out, and that insurance churn is very challenging to ensure continuity of care. There's a lot of variability in how we're trained. If you go to this residency program, to this fellowship, you will see brachial plexus and peripheral nerve. I didn't see a ton of brachial plexus and peripheral nerve in my fellowship. I did a couple of nerve transfer cases with Dr. Gelberman, and then I sought some additional training afterwards. This was part of the training in, at HSS, but it's not a part of the training in many places. So a lot of people don't see this, so they don't know even how to start approaching it. So it's part of that you know, mystification of this, uh, of this injury. And I'm glad that you guys have the opportunity to learn how to take care of this. There's a lot of shortcomings in our literature. We often rely on our anecdotal experience. You see how hard it is to report outcomes because it's such a heterogeneous group of patients, injuries, treatments. There's no way to systematically um, uh, conduct you know, a randomized trial, for example. There's a lot of disagreement. You know, a lot of what you get depends on who you see. So if you've trained here with, say, for example, Dr. McKinnon, you're going to get a very different type of approach than if you trained overseas or if you trained at HSS or you trained with me and Dr. Brogan. And experienced surgeons disagree in important ways as to the management of brachial plexus injury. You have neurosurgeons, hand surgeons, plastic surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, all taking care of this injury. And we're trained and we have different tools. And I would argue that it's better when we work together to take care of these patients. And obviously, at the end of the day, it should not be ignored. Technical skill is part of it. You know, these are hard cases to do, and not everybody wants to do these cases. And there is some element of, you know, having somebody like Dr. Brogan, for example, who can do some microsurgery magic and bring, um, you know, things like free muscle transfers to our armamentarium is incredibly helpful. Then there are the patient factors. You know, the patient, you try to read them as soon as you see them. Some patients, you know, see the glass half full. Some see it half empty and some see it differently. As we mentioned earlier, mental health is a big part of this. Depression, anxiety in almost half of our patients, suicidal ideation in a third of patients that were seen at HSS. Finding purpose, I've realized, is just so important to these patients regardless of what we do for them. So if I give them an M4 elbow or I give them an M0 elbow, um, if they find something to do with their time, it will help their adjustment after injury. There's really poor literature out there, but cobbling together tables in these three papers, roughly about 40% of patients return to work, and I would argue it's probably less than that. And then as we know, patients have different coping skills and strategies. You see it in the catastrophization scores, for example, that you see in Promise uh, in clinic. And we've, we study this here, and one of our medical students looked at this with us, and there's a unique profile of coping within brachial plexus injury patients that's different than age match controls. 
So we're scratching the surface on what we could do for these patients, but we really didn't know what patients thought. So we decided to conduct some qualitative research. Now, I talked about the different types of research strategies, and, and one of the things that Dr. Lee wanted me to address was how you incorporate new methodologies and, and, um, into your research. And I did a lot of this population-based research, so-called database or big data research, and you get a really high-level view of what's going on. So you know what's going on throughout Cardinal State, and you know that the, the crowd is happy because the cards are winning. Our standard kind of paradigm for clinical research and quantitative research is to look at one section of, of folks and say, how are these people doing? Okay. And then can we generalize how this section of the stadium in Big Mac land is doing compared to the rest of the stadium? Is this a generalizable conclusion? Can't really do that with plexus patients because we don't have apples to apples a lot of times. What you do with qualitative research is you don't ask all of Big Mac land what's going on. You ask this front row of Big Mac land and you say, all right, let's really dive deep into what's going on in the front row of Big Mac land and see what their experience is at the game. Now, you're hoping it's generalizable, but you know it's not going to be the same for the guys that are in the back row of Big Mac land. So qualitative studies are designed to overcome the limits of the quantitative work because you are looking for deeper meaning, complexity, and context. So you do interviews. You have an interview guide that you develop based on your knowledge and maybe talking to some patients. And, and you have essentially semi-structured interviews that last a long time. They're about 45 minutes, an hour, depending on the question you're trying to ask. You can see that we're audio recording them. We pull patients out of clinic to do this after obtaining consent. And then you end up with these transcripts um, that you then have to analyze and try to figure out you know, what's in here. So this is not the same as, you know, looking at the, um, you know, the MRC scores in Excel and running a, a you know, a t-test. It's very different. So once you've reviewed those transcripts and multiple people have reviewed them, you get the large themes on the board when you meet as a group. You know, what the things that you thought were going on. So, for example, social support, emotion, affect, you know, information they've received from other people, interactions with the clinical team, decision making. And you can see here some of the representative quotes, you know, feeling like they're a guinea pig because we tell them these are, these are newer treatments and there is no, you know, consistent outcome. Now, I never told anybody a guinea pig, but what matters is not what I say, but what they remember. And these are all my patients, by the way. So this is incredibly humbling to read all of these interviews. Um, and I didn't do the interviews for a number of reasons. You organize these themes into categories. So you try to put the pieces together. So you have physical, mental um, ways of dealing with other things. Then you start to define your first set of codes and, and you add representative quotes. And your codes are like your, um, you know, your first element of a data point. And then you're going to have a bunch of codes within a theme. So here's an example. Um, one thing that we don't talk about a lot that is talked a little bit more about is in the birth palsy um, uh, group. But appearance, statements about what their affected limb looks like and other, how other people might see it. And you know, while we think we have greater priorities in terms of restoring function, this is something that truly matters to patients. And learning that this was important to patients has led me to at least talk to them differently and I think counsel them a bit differently. Now, now some people will do the qualitative research analysis all by hand, but it is useful to have these transcripts and, and have them uh, use analysis software to help. So you can see here, this is a pain quote along here. Um, and then as you assign codes, this will actually tell you how frequently codes come up. You can see pains running along in here. So this is just a, a flipped image over here. And then you can see the different kinds of uh, ways that you can exploit these kinds of data. So it can show you visually what's popping out of these transcripts. So we did 15 patient interviews and we also interviewed 15 surgeons. Um, you know, so we took advantage of this at a, you know, the Hand Society, the Academy, the ASPN meetings. And, um, and, and talking to these surgeons, we tried to ask them what they thought the barriers too. So we've got almost a 360 type perspective. So we were like, yeah, we learned a lot and we went and shared this with our patients and they told us, this is not new. Like this is, this is of course, this is what we're experiencing. And if you look at what we found and what we reported in these papers, it's very similar to what Marie found when she analyzed all these posts from Facebook. Um, so it, it does mesh. It does have some element of generalizability. And while these interviews were all with WashU patients, I'm pretty sure if you did this throughout the United States, at least, you would see very similar um, results. So what patients told us is that there are big knowledge gaps. Patients want to know more about the, the journey. Like it is a journey because, you know, you're looking at a three to five year recovery because it probably involves multiple surgeries. And what's a realistic ultimate outcome? and how long to get there. And these are really hard questions to answer because they're so patient specific, not only plexus specific, but actually the patient age, functional demands, expectations, et cetera. 
and they want more education about, you know, we tell them do this, do that, don't do that because you're going to ruin your nerve transfer, et cetera. They want to know how that might affect the outcomes because it's very easy for us to flippantly say, well, of course, you're not going to take your sling off for three weeks, but that can really stink for some patients who have a hard time taking care of themselves. So one quote, that's an example, telling me I have a 60% chance of healing is telling me I'll be better again. But tell me now, don't break my heart every three weeks for two years, just do it. And you see this when you see patients, you tell them come back in six weeks, come back in six weeks, you kind of forget what you told them the last time and you have the same spiel every time. Some patients just want to know right away and want that closure. Um, and one of the things that we've taken from this was to develop a plexus specific um, education guide for these patients, getting them through this journey. Um, and fortunately, um, you know, Caroline's going to help us uh, with some of this research going forward too. There are varying levels of engagement among patients. You see this in your clinic, regardless of the type of injuries you treat. The levels of engagement vary highly. Some people are all in on the decision-making. They wanted to help you decide whether to fix their distal radius fracture or not. Some people say, I'm not the doctor, it's up to you. Um, and that can be really challenging for a plexus patient because you don't know how all in they are in, on their recovery too, because they've got to do a lot, a lot of therapy. Some patients want to be included into decisions and some people who are more engaged are more compliant and less angry about the whole situation. And anger is a real thing that you see um, when patients are a bit disappointed with their outcome, even though we try to temper their expectations. Now, as Marty Boyer has taught me, I never tell people they quote need surgery unless it's cancer or heart disease, but they pretty much need surgery when they've gotten to the point where they, nothing's coming back, but they want to feel like there was an option. Um, and then patients want to feel like they're in charge. Spell it out so I feel like I'm quarterbacking this, even though I'm not letting me feel like it. And that's where you know, the, the art and the, uh, you know, the magic comes in with being a clinician. So we're trying to develop this coaching program, which is admittedly quite hard, trying to model it based on some of the oncology navigation programs. And this is something that I'd like to implement in our program. It's obviously difficult now with COVID, um, so we've taken a pause with that, but long-term, this is one of the goals we have. So we're looking at what, satisfy, what are the drivers of satisfaction for patients. And although we like to think it is, function is not necessarily the driver of satisfaction in this cohort. Um, they're really looking at, you know, if they have a sense of purpose, if they have social support, they're likely gonna be much happier. And equally as important, the markers of dissatisfaction are when they get disconnected from family and friends and they feel abandoned. Uh, and there are a lot of heartbreaking stories in these interviews. And like I mentioned earlier, it was really humbling as a surgeon to read about things in these transcripts that were going on in the course of my patients' lives that I had no clue. I had no clue about the divorces and being shunned by their family and losing their jobs. And I had one patient who had a really good outcome. I had no idea he was homeless for three months during his recovery. And this is an example. There were a lot of times where I felt really alone. I begged my wife over and over again to help me, but she was in over her head and didn't have the time. I just wanted my family. So we're trying to incorporate satisfaction, incorporate social support in our work going forward, both research and clinically. And looking at the surgeons, surgeons agreed, social and mental issues are important. If you ask our department, a lot of people will say it's important. Some people really dive into this. Other people have no idea what to do with it and say, this is not my job. And I think that's understandable. And one of the quotes from interviewing surgeons was that from a healthcare system perspective, addressing social barriers is not an efficient use of the surgeon's time. Sometimes you meet a patient and you know they don't have resiliency and they're not going to do well. Would you still indicate that patient for surgery knowing that they're not going to do well? Or what do you do on the front end to try to address that? And these are the things that we struggle with in our clinic. Setting expectations is the surgeon's job. Realistic expectations are really, really important, but it takes time to read patients. And this is why I like to, when the residents ask, when you guys ask, you know, when should we send this patient? I'd rather see them earlier not because I'm gonna do anything differently if I see them at two weeks or four weeks versus six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, but because I wanna meet them more than one time before we have to have the hard talk about surgery. So a couple of quotes from surgeons. Um, if someone with a complete plexus injury expects to play the piano and tennis, that is not realistic. It means that I have not done a good job at educating them. I think that the first four to six months of a new plexus patient is reading them. But a lot of times you don't have four to six months. So that's one of the challenging things. If you wait that long, your window to re-innervate starts to close. So rewinding, here are the kind of high level um, predictors, I think, of outcomes after brachial plexus injury. So let's think about our patient. So this gentleman, again, 33 years old, came in six weeks out from his injury. We ended up seeing, examining him two times, seeing him at three months. He had a cord level injury below the clavicle. He's got a good hand. This is a total win with regards to the plexus injury. There are far worse injuries that we treat. He was treated here. 
our residents did a great job identifying the injury. Um, and that helps us because now we're seeing him a lot earlier than you would if, if they had come in from somewhere else and they weren't told about their injury. I like to think that Dr. Brogan and I are able to, to provide excellent care for these patients. We have broad backgrounds in terms of our training. We disagree at, at times in terms of what to do, but I think we have a good sense of what's going to help our patients. And I think this reconstruction is pretty similar to what this patient would get if he went to most centers in the United States. I think this is where we struck out. I did not read this patient well. I had no idea he was going to have this difficulty. There was a lot of anger in his follow-up visits. I don't know if it was directed at me, directed at the situation, and you can see his promised depression and anxiety scores. We missed the boat on this one. I think while patients are who they are, I think we had an opportunity to do better for this patient at the front. So what we do is more than nerve surgery. Um, what we're trying to do going forward is assess outcomes from different perspectives, function, use, quality of life, satisfaction, do a better job at educating and coaching our patients through the entire process, and then continuing our integrated multidisciplinary clinic. The extension of this is what ultimately became um, the R1 funded study. It started as a small couple center cohort through the Hand Society's grant. Um, and now we've expanded to doing us, HSS, Ortho Carolina, Vanderbilt, and Hopkins, and enrolling patients prospectively at each of these centers who are treated for plexus injuries. So the prospective longitudinal assessment of nerve trauma, there, the impetus for this was the lack of prospective studies using patient reported outcomes in the plexus literature. I did this research, I did this search before, and I did it again when I was writing a grant last year. There are no prospective studies from the United States for brachial plexus injury in the literature. So this would be the first if we're able to pull this off. And our goal is ultimately to facilitate rigorous comparative studies. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we can't do RCTs. We're not at the point where we can um, tell surgeons to do things differently, but if we develop enough data based on how these patients do with sort of quote usual care, perhaps we can say, let's say uh, one center continues to do nerve transfers, the other center does graphs and try to compare, or at least compare the patients who are treated differently at different institutions, saying nerve graft patients at HSS, Ortho Carolina, Vanderbilt, um, uh, Wash U, uh, versus the nerve transfer patients at those institutions. The way that we angled this for the grant was to making it about selecting the most appropriate patient reported instrument. We think we have a really good instrument, but there are legacy instruments that we're going to be expected to use in the literature. And then collecting it prospectively, same outcome measures, same time frame. So pre-op, one year, two years, and five years. The DASH is the, the thing that's been used the most in the literature um, in terms of patient reported outcome measures. Promise um, is uh, obviously a, an important one to include going forward. We have our impact of brachial plexus injury questionnaire and then based on what our collaborators told us, they wanted to include the SF36. So let's see which one is the best one. Let's determine the responsiveness of these instruments in the plexus population um, to see how, uh, how we can gauge our, the success of our outcomes. And then look at the relationship of these outcome measures to things like manual muscle strength. Now, one of the things I think was an advantage for us is that we really tried to gain patient input on the most appropriate outcomes measure. It shouldn't just be us deciding that. So our planet patients and also looking uh, um, through our United Brachial Plexus Network uh, volunteers. So a patient advocacy group is going to be involved in our research. And I think that was one of the more attractive things about our project. So looking at it differently, here is a schematic of how outcomes will be reported and um, obtained. So pre-op surgery, one and two and five years post-op. We have all of the patient reported measures here and then all the surgeon reported questionnaires here. Even if we only got this information down here, the surgeon reported measures, this would be a big step forward in the literature because there is no prospective collection of data. But while we're doing this, I also want to include the patient perspective, which would really move our field forward. So as of you know, 2020, this is how we would assess patients. Let's call this guy Jack Shepard, okay? So this is what I would think of when I see this patient back in clinic, I think about, how long it was from his injury to his surgery. I think about the surgery he had. And this is the outcome measure we would use. You would track over time how well he did with shoulder abduction, elbow flexion, and rudimentary use of his hand. What are we missing? You can see that this patient is upset. He's not happy with his results. It's going so far as to say he hated it. This is where I want us to go. When I see this patient in clinic, I hopefully in five years we're able to do this we'll have a measure of his social support built into our dashboard. Well, you have this measure here, which is a validated um, instrument, looking at how much support this patient has through his family, through his uh, um, support network. We'll have, of course, the manual muscle testing, but we'll go so far, and um, uh, Sally Jo is gonna help us with this, with motion capture. And looking at when we bring patients into a, a lab, 
what is, what is their body look like? How much are they using their arm? And what kind of compensatory patterns do we have? We'll have our promise scores, continuing to look at pain, depression, anxiety. We'll have wearable data, which Araqua is gonna help us with too. And looking at when we get, give patients essentially a research grade Fitbit, and then going home and saying, all right, well, do you actually use this? Because they'll tell you a lot of stuff when they see you in the office, but do they actually use it? So having a week's worth of data is gonna be really, really useful. And then we'll have our patient reported outcome measure that we developed and that we've tried to push forward. So rating their disability at before surgery and then one year, two year, five years and the amount of improvement that they have compared to what they expected. This is where I want us to go. This is the goal for our group in terms of you know, using the research to inform this to develop the infrastructure. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, I have a, a lot of uh, gratitude for my partners and in particular, uh, Dr. Brogan, we persevere through a lot with our nerve clinic is certainly uh, a labor of love at times, uh, and we are thankful to Pod4 for this wonderful sign. So that's the first part of the talk. I'm happy to take questions now about the plexus part of it, um, and also I think we can take a short break before we dive into the rest. <laughs>